With more than 6,000 small and microcap companies listed, if you're looking for the next Apple at the earliest stage, then Channel Check truly is the orchard. The listed companies support Channel Check, so it's free for you, the potential investor, to gain access to institutional quality research from FINRA licensed analysts, advanced market data, industry reports, news, and a growing catalog of videos and webcasts. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and register for Channel Check so you're always up to date on what's going on at the small and microcap data place. Welcome to this special edition of the C-Suite series presented by Channel Check and Noble Capital Markets. Noble is an SEC-registered FINRA-licensed broker-dealer and the source of the equity research available on Channel Check. This Uranium Power Players Investor Forum presentation features energy fuels, NYSE ticker symbol UUUU, TSX ticker symbol EFR, following a brief overview presentation from President and CEO Mark Chalmers, Noble Senior Research Analyst Michael Heim will moderate a Q&A session. With that, I am pleased to present Mark Chalmers. Hello everybody, my name is Mark Chalmers and it's my pleasure to be presenting at the conference today to talk about energy fuels, which I believe is a unique uh, investment opportunity for those that are interested in electrification uh, and reduction of carbon emissions. This first slide um, shows a picture of the White Mesa Mill, which is our hub of our critical mineral production. And you can see up in the upper right-hand corner that the main uh, critical minerals that we produce are uranium, rare earths, vanadium, we're now embarking on a new initiative, which is recovery of medical isotopes at the mill and recycling. I may be making some forward-looking statements. Those are included at the back of the presentation. Just a bit more about energy fuels um, and in a little bit more detail. Uh, energy fuels, first and foremost, is a uranium producer, and we are the have been the largest producer of uranium for a number of years and we have more assets that are able to go back into production quicker, faster than anybody else in the United States. We also recently uh, entered, and recently being last year and a half, uh, the rare earth element business, and we're successfully uh, producing rare earth carbonate uh, at the White Mesa Mill. We're more advanced than any other company when it comes to processing uh, in North America. We also have a long history of producing vanadium, another critical element. Um, and we have a history going back for nearly 40 years with vanadium. Uh, vanadium is uh, becoming of increasing interest as the prices go up. Uh, also a potential element for grid cell uh, scale batteries for renewable energy storage systems. The medical isotopes, as I said, is new, but because when we're processing rare earth elements that have uh, contained thorium, uh, we believe we may have a path to monetize some of the thorium and the isotopes at the White Mesa Mill, which could be an absolutely uh, significant additional addition to the energy fuel story. We also have a long history of recycling. I'll talk about that more in a minute. We have a very strong balance sheet with zero debt and in the order of $100 million of cash or working capital in the form of inventory. So we're in a very strong position to execute all our plans right now. We also have taken um, a, a significant uh, high interest and in, increased our focus on sustainability. We released our first sustainability report uh, at the end of 2020. It is a very powerful document. It is on our website, and I don't believe there is any other mining company uh, that can tout uh, the, 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 the abilities that or equal the abilities that our company has to reduce carbon emissions and assist with electrification in the Americas. This is our footprint uh, of our uh, activities and our projects from Wyoming down to Texas. We have three fully licensed and paid for production facilities. Two of them are in situ recovery, the Nichols Ranch in Wyoming the Alta Mesa in Texas, they're both on standby. And then the Blue Star is White Mesa Mill in the Four Corners region in Utah. We have a number of other projects that surround 
um, these um, production centers and we have more licensed uranium projects and vanadium projects than anybody else in the United States. Many people will not understand that the United States gets 20% of its electric power from nuclear energy. So it's a substantial um, contributor to clean energy, low carbon emission energy, and it's 55% of the carbon-free energy in the United States of America. So this slide uh, just shows that front line. Again, the White Mesa Mill, which is producing, that is where uh, the uranium, vanadium, and the rare earth elements um, are being currently produced. Um, and then you have the Alta Mesa in Texas. It's on standby. It is a uranium-only facility, Nichols Ranch on standby in Wyoming. It's a uranium-only facility. And then you have the Pinion Plain Mine in Arizona, which is a underground mine that is largely developed, highest grade uranium mine in the United States. And I actually built this in 1988, so I know this mine pretty well. This next slide um, shows where has uranium been produced in the United States come from for the last 15 years. And there really are two major players. Cameco, which is light blue, the 25 million pounds produced over a 15 year period. In the blue, the 16.7, that is uranium production from energy fuels assets. If you combine energy fuels and Cameco, 85% of the uranium produced over 15 years came from two companies. If you include uranium one uh, and uh, UR Energy, they're in the red and the light blue, um, 97% of the uranium came from four companies. So there are really only a handful of companies that have produced material amounts of uranium in the United States. And those companies we believe are best positioned for the future. So this slide just shows where we fit in uh, with our uranium peer group. <coughs> we really don't have a peer group uh, at all because of what we do. And this slide shows that we're kind of in the middle of the pack. Uh, you know, we have this strong uh, cash and working capital position that I mentioned, nearly $100 million, zero debt, which is the differentiator. We have uh, inventory that we produce. Now, some of the other companies have actually purchased uranium, but we produced all of our uranium. But the key differentiator is we've had uranium production recently. We have the ability and have recent vanadium production. We have the recycling that we've been doing. We have the rare earths that we're currently doing when we are embarking on the recovery of these medical isotopes. So there is no other uranium group that can tout that, but we can at Energy Fuels, and that is a substantial differentiator. It diversifies your investment. So let's talk a little bit about um, rare earths and uranium because they fit together perfectly because the best Feeds of rare earths contain uranium, and that is a problem for everyone else out there but energy fuels and CNNC in China. So we think this is a uh, probably a generational opportunity. We're very excited about it. A number of people have said that it is the missing link for reestablishing rare earth production, uh, not only in the United States, but around the world. And so we're going for it. Uh, we have uh, recently began commercial production. We're more advanced than any other company in the Americas when it comes to processing rare earths. We are uh, very focused on achieving full integration of rare earth production in the next two to three years. And we're making substantial strides on that front. And the White Mesa Mill is just the ideal location for a number of reasons I'll go into in a few minutes. And we're focused on monazite. And why monazite? Because monazite is the most valuable rare earth mineral stream out there. And it is a byproduct of heavy mineral sands production. It's produced in the United States, in Australia, in Brazil, in Africa, and elsewhere. And it mainly, uh, as I said, is a byproduct of zirconium and titanium production. So um, it's got extremely high grades. The monazite sands that show up at the mill are between 50 and 60% total rare earth oxides. It can be over 60%. 
So it is higher than other feed streams that other people are trying to advance. Uh, it has very good distributions of NDPR, which is the main elements for um, electric magnets. It has higher grades of heavies than typical bassinite. It's substantially higher grade, and that is a differentiator, and that is the key to our business model. So let's talk a little bit more about the White Mesa Mill. As I said, it, it, it exists. Um, it has all the license to process monazite right now for the crack and leach. We are able to get it into production with minor upgrades that were in the order of a couple million dollars. If you look at a crack and leach facility in other parts of the world, you probably spend three to four hundred million dollars for a crack and leach facility alone. It's highly scalable. We have ample capacity. The facility has licenses to produce 700 or process 720,000 tons of uranium ores per year. Um, this initial material that we're, we're processing from Kim Ores only represents less than a percent of the mill's capacity. If we get up to some of our, our objectives of 15 to 20,000 tons of monazite per year, that would be less than 2% of the capacity. So we're really excited about how the White Mesa Mill can contribute to rare earth production. Um, now, I wanna talk a little bit about what we're doing right now. Um, as I said, we're just fairly recent into the rare earth business. We've only been actively pursuing it for about a year and a half. So right now we're securing this monazite sand um, from Georgia, from the Comores Company very high grade. We're looking at other potential sources of monocyte around the world. I think we're talking to six or seven companies right now, and they are interested. And we're per currently producing the rare earth carbonate, and we're currently shipping uh, the rare earth carbonate to Estonia with an arrangement with Neo Performance Materials because there is no separation capacity in any of the Americas. So we plan to fix that looking out a few years. We, we plan to have a US centric supply chain. Uh, we, we plan to have full integration, uh, sort of at the, in the order of magnitude of Linus in Australia, which is the largest producer outside of China. And we will continue to focus on the monocyte sands and capture the full value chain in the rare earth supply chain in the United States of America. We've already hired caristers out of France. Caristers are known as the world leaders in designing and constructing uh, separated oxide plants. Uh, they've done this work in France and in China, and uh, we're very excited about that. And the White Mesa Mill has over a 40-year history of recovering uranium and vanadium using SX technology. And that is, again, a big differentiator because Typically, rare earth oxides are recovered using SX technology. So we are used to solvent extraction. So this is just what I said in words uh, in a graphic showing where we are now with the monazite ore from Kimores, the cracking, the leaching, the shipping, the, the carbonate to Neo. Uh, and we were able to achieve that in, in about a year's time and that blew people away. If you look out in the next two, three years, we're going for full integration. And I can tell you right now, we are going for full integration. If there's any naysayers out there, they're gonna be, na they're gonna be naysayers and they're gonna be wrong. We plan to have full integration quicker, faster, at lower cost than anybody else out there in all the Americas, perhaps the world. Okay, now this slide is an important slide. Why can energy fuels succeed when others have struggled or failed? Well, number one, we have the licenses and the capabilities to handle the radionuclides in the monocyte, which others have not been able to deal with, and we can't. And, and, and the number two, monocyte is higher in value relative to other rare earth mineral feeds. It's higher in NDPR, which is the main um, uh, magnet um, elements, uh, and it's higher in heavies. Grade is king no matter where you go in the resource industry. Monazite is mined around the US and around the world as a low cost byproduct. There's no need to build mines and it is a byproduct of primarily zircon and titanium production. 
Monazite processing is straightforward. That is important. It is low cost and capital efficient. I don't believe that there are any other uh, rare earth producers that can, that can replicate our strike rate on both capital and operating costs. I mentioned we could retrofit the White Mesa Mill into crack and leach facility for a few million dollars. Most people that would cost three to four hundred million dollars at least. Um, we have used SX uh, processing uh, at the mill for over 40 years, so we understand SX. That's the main technology used for rare earth separation, so we're well advanced there. And the state of Utah is a great place to do business. It's low cost. It's a supportive jurisdiction. And we believe it is a better jurisdiction to do business in California and Australia and many other jurisdictions. So let's talk about what we've accomplished in a little over 12 months. It's getting closer to like 18 months now. Uh, we've engaged some of the leading rare earth professionals in the entire world. We've got a very strong relationship with Constantine Kirianopoulos, uh, who is one of the most probably recognized as the most successful um, rare earth person in the world with Neo Performance Materials. Brock O'Kelly worked at Mountain Pass for 35 years. We got Jack Lifton. Uh, many of you will know he has a talk show. He talks about rare earths and he's worked in the rare earth business for about 50 years. Frederick uh, works for Carister in France. And then recently, Chris Wyatt, who's a heavy mineral sands um, expert, has joined us to help secure additional monazite at the front end of our strategy. So we're out looking for monocyte sands. We've got the agreement, a three-year agreement with Kimors and Georgia currently supplying. Hyperion Metals, we got an MOU with them. They're advancing a known deposit in Tennessee. And we're basically talking to all the monocyte producers that we know of in the entire world, and they are all listening. I believe we will secure material amounts of monocyte in the coming months or year or two to support our activities. We're ramping up the production of the mixed rare earth carbonate at the mill. I talked about the very minimum uh, capacity required at the mill relative to what it is designed to do. Um, the rare earth separation, we are moving forward with that, working with Carister and with support from Neo. I talked about our experience with solvent extraction we're also collaborating with a number of the national labs. We're also beginning to look at rare earth uh, metals and alloys, and we're excited about that, but that's coming after the rare earth separation. And we've received around $2 million of support from the Department of Energy uh, in the rare earth processing space. So now let's look at this slide. Where's our market position with the rare earth producers? You can see from this um, the slide, um, that the companies like Aluka and Linus and MP have substantially higher market caps than we do. Now we are focused on catching up with Linus and MP materials. So we are shooting big and shooting high because of the unique advantage that we have on our monocyte plant. I also want to uh, point out when you look at the value of the monocyte compared to bassinite, uh, look at the basket value, recovered basket value of the feeds we're looking at at energy fuels, there is a massive differentiator between the bassinite and the monazite. With the material from Kimors recovered um, at being around $17,000 per ton. So let's talk about vanadium. We have a long history of producing vanadium. We're the largest producer um, a couple of years ago. Uh, we have around $16 million at current prices of vanadium, high purity. 99.7% V2O5 in inventory. <coughs> we have the ability to restart our vanadium uh, production. It is a critical mineral. Uh, vanadium prices have nearly doubled uh, since the beginning of the year. And then um, this, this next slide, uh, this is a new initiative just announced at the end of July, the strategic alliance with RADTRAN for the recovery of medical isotopes from the thorium. Typically, Monazite ores have two to maybe 6% thorium in the monazite sands, and we believe we have a beneficial use that we can hopefully monetize in due course. The world is running out of isotopes. And so White Mesa, with our plans, is the ideal source of isotopes going forward. 
and it allows us to use the thorium to treat cancer. So think about that, treat cancer. So our focus is these alpha emitting isotopes. Uh, a number of major pharmaceutical companies are studying uh, the isotopes, the alpha emitting isotopes, uh, and uh, they're in uh, for uh, approval with the FDA. And so watch this space. We're very excited about this, and it could be a material differentiator on our cost of producing rares around the world uh, with this um, initiative alone on top of all the other advantages. So uranium recycling, we have a long history. The reason the White Mesa Mill exists today is because we are able to take uh, various feeds of natural uranium and recycle it, recover the uranium. Uh, if you look at the amount of uranium we recovered over the last couple decades, it would be equivalent to a coal train, thermal coal, going from LA to New York and almost all the way back to LA. So this is a very um, substantial contributor uh, it's 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 minor compared to uranium, rare earths, and probably even vanadium, but it is uh, another differentiator between an investment in energy fuels and others. This slide basically shows um, another initiative that we're working on. This kind of goes in the recycling bucket. It shows the Four Corners region. You can see where the White Mesa Mill is in the blue star. Um, the kind of orange is the Navajo Nation. The red dots are abandoned uranium mines that were either never reclaimed or poorly reclaimed. Uh, these are mines that have nothing to do with energy fuels. Um, these are mines that were mined uh, with support of programs from the US government. Uh, the government has collected nearly $2 billion in trust. We're still actively looking uh, at um, trying to use the White Mesa Mill uh, to help clean up some of these sites. Uh, we are currently, uh, this, the little um, green star uh, is a private site that we're currently doing this on. And we have been for the last couple of years, we received about 40,000 tons uh, of material uh, truck from that site up to White Mesa. And we can do the absolute same thing, um, clean up these abandoned mine sites. So, uh, you know, watch this space. We plan to make substantial progress here uh, in the, the coming years. Uh, it's quite political, um, mainly because the NGOs would rather not have it cleaned up and they'd rather have this on the Navajo Nation um, not being addressed uh, than help energy fuels. So um, we also um, have an accretive uh, dis uh, di disposal of some of our non-core assets with International Consolidated Uranium. Uh, this is not a reflection of these assets are great assets. They produce more uranium. If you look at these assets that we're selling, they would be number five on that chart over the last 15 years. But we don't have time to focus on them, so we are in the process of uh, selling these assets, the Tony M, the Nanaros, and the Rim, um, with a total million agreement. The total consideration is up to $24 million. We'll get cash. We'll be the largest shareholder of CUR uh, on closing, which should be in the near term, uh, and we'll get a number of progress payments over time and when they go into production. I will also be on the board of CUR, and I'm very excited about this because we were not getting value for these assets in our portfolio, and I'd rather have CUR advancing them while we're advancing both our uranium and our rare earth business in the medical isotope space. So let's just talk about our financial strength. Um, you know, I mentioned around $100 million. That's actually conservative because that includes our inventories uh, as shown on the table. Uranium at $23 a pound versus the current price of $33 something a pound. Vanadium at $5 a pound on the books compared to nearly $10 a pound. If you adjust for just the current values of metal prices, you could add another nearly $15 million to the $98 million. Um, it does not include some uh, warrants that uh, are being exercised, which will uh, add uh, somewhere in the order of another eight to 10 million to that number. Uh, and it does not include the value of the transaction with, uh, with CUR um, on the disposal of these non-core assets. So we are in an extremely strong financial position going forward. So in closing, there is no investment like energy fuels out there. If you want exposure to reducing carbon emissions, electrifications, 
Energy Fuels gives you all of that in one investment. We have unmatched proven history when it comes to producing uranium. The rare earths is very exciting. I showed the multi-billion dollar opportunity of growing that alone. Vanadium, existing inventories and ability to respond as well. The medical isotopes, we're just getting started there. Very exciting, the recycling and our financial strength. We're fully funded to do everything we need to do for the next few years. And so watch this space. Thank you very much. And I'll now open it up to uh, questions from Michael. All right, thank you, Mark, for running through the presentation. Very interesting. Um, this is a uranium conference, so I'm going to start with some uranium questions, but I definitely want to get into uh, some of the other components of your company later. I want to start out with a little bit of a discussion on the pinion mine, because this isn't this is something we haven't spent a lot of time talking about in the past, and you kind of got my attention when you uh, when your slide says it could be uh, some of the lowest cost production. Give me the history of that mine a sense of how big it might be and why you think it might be one of the lower cost uranium mines? Well, the Pinion mine is sort of a momentum mine. It's it's not a large mine, but it's a good momentum mine. So, you know, when price of uranium goes up, um, it's something we can put into production quite quickly. Um, I built the mine in 1988 and uh, I worked for the private energy fuels. There was a private energy fuels that mined a number of these breccia pipes that are located in Northern Arizona. And so I've mined, I think five or six of them. So, you know, it's it's kind of unique in the fact that I have a long history of mining in that region. Um, and we mined a lot of uranium um, back in the eighties and I constructed the pinion mine um, back in the eighties and it got stopped by the courts. It was injuncted and that's what stopped it back in the eighties. Otherwise it would be mined by now. Now, we believe that the going forward cost of mining at um, Pinion Plain uh, is in the order of about $30 a pound. Um, it, again, it's relatively small, but it can probably produce around 750,000 uh, pounds to a million pounds for three or four years while we're gearing up all our other projects. Is this uh, a uranium that would go to the White Mills or is it in situ recovery or? It's conventional mining. Um, it's around 1% um, uranium. Uh, it's very concentrated in a very small core area. Uh, the shaft has been sunk. Um, we've drilled it out extensively. We still have some uh, drilling to do and we still have some development to do, but literally that 1% ore is like 10 feet away. Uh, there's a, like a 10 foot barrier between where the ore is and, and where we've developed too. Okay, and of course we're not uh, producing uranium or vandium, and you've kind of said not through the uh, the rest of this year. When do you make a decision on next year, and what are your initial thoughts on uh, 2022? Well, we it's kind of interesting because the price of vanadium has gone up enough that you could probably start mining vanadium um, right now economically. Um, the problem is, is vanadium can be very spiky, as you know, Michael, and it can go up and down like a yo-yo. Um, you know, we, we do need higher uranium prices. I mean, you know, technically we could probably mine uh, something like Pinion Plain uh, right now and make a tiny margin on it, but we want higher prices. So, you know, we're really not going to get very serious about mining uranium, uh, new uranium, until the price gets, you know, you know, high 40s into the 50s. And then we'll start uh, looking at which projects we start up. Uh, the Pinion Plain mine is the one that we'll probably start up at the earliest because it's our lowest cost operation. And it's lower cost than anybody else in the United States to produce that 750 to a million pounds per year. One of, your, uh, one of the other uranium companies uh, signed a supply contract and tied it to market prices. Is that something that makes sense? It seems like it gives you a little optionality that you can either fulfill the supply contract with spot or uh, if prices get high enough with production. Yeah, there's, um, you know, there's just starting maybe some interest and, and look, we, we, we continue to um, submit proposals to some of the utilities. There's not a lot of uh, RFPs going out there, but we submit them and we put in prices that we think we need to uh, really justify uh, restarting of production. So, uh, but, you know, we also have uh, around 700,000 pounds of, of uranium that we can also put into the mix. 
uranium that we produce, not bought. Um, so uh, yeah, no, the, I think the market is starting to change here. So there's a number of different mechanisms that could be used uh, that could make sense. The general feeling is that uh, the utilities have left themselves a little exposed in 23, 24. Is that kind of your belief? Yeah, I, I think the utilities have gotten addicted to cheap. And, um, you know, everybody talks about wanting, you know, U.S. produced, you know, materials, not just, you know, uranium or rare earths, uh, but, you know, materials as a whole. But when it really comes down to it, a lot of people go, well, I, 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 I don't want to get it from China. I don't want to get it from Russia, but I don't want to pay more for it either. So it, it's kind of, you know, irrational from my perspective. But, um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, I think the world's changing right now when it comes to um, the known dependence that we have on some countries who don't want to be that dependent on. Okay, let's jump over to the rare earth elements then. And in, in, at the uh, the last uh, second quarter numbers, you did have to uh, bring down your expectations in terms of what you'll process because of some uh, supply issues. Give us the latest update on what you're hearing from Tremors in terms of uh, are they going to be able to meet the new lowered expectations? Is there a chance that maybe they uh, will be able to ramp things up? Yeah, look, we're, we continue to talk to Camorras. They haven't given me specific numbers. Um, uh, yeah, they were short. They had some operational problems. They are trying to resolve those issues. They are talking about, um, you know, tr working with us to increase production, perhaps over what the, the, the agreement says, uh, or even substantially greater. So we don't have any new guidance on that. Uh, we are expecting <coughs> around... Uh, this last run we did was about 300 tons of, um, uh, of monocyte sand uh, that we did this last few months. Uh, the next ship we're expecting six to 800 tons. So we continue to kind of ramp it up. I mean, really, Michael, the one thing that and and is when it looks when we look forward over the next two three years to really get the economics, we need those larger quantities when we have the ability to separate because that's when you get the margins and you get the scale to come up with a real profitable outcome. Now, processing rare earths at the current scale is probably break even, maybe a little bit positive, um, but it's it's not the long-term objective. So once we get more uh, information back from Jamores on what they can supply us, we'll update the market accordingly. But right now we're getting all the material we need to prove our ability to crack and leach. And the guys are have learned a lot uh, they're learning about the recoveries, they're learning about the reagent consumptions and, and how that material goes through the mill. So it's been a very valuable relationship with Camorras. And when does the Hyperion contract kick in? Well, it's a it's an MOU. Uh, they're um, advancing their resource. It's a known resource. Both Camorras and, um, and Aluka have had that property in the past. I've had a number of people tell me that the secret of making that an economic project is a connection with White Mesa and Monocyte. So it's a known um, known deposit. Um, the biggest issue, the reason it wasn't developed in the past is because of the issues with the radioactivity and the Monocyte in particular. So, uh, you know, it's still a, a year or so off. They're talking about a small mining operation that could start next year, that could start supplying uh, at least small quantities of monazite, and small being, you know, in the order of maybe a thousand tons per year. So it's all a building story. Now I know that the rare earth has taken up only a small part of the capacity of, of uh, white mill. Have you put it on a separate circuit yet, or there's really no need till you start talking about uh, bringing uranium back into production? Yeah, we haven't put it on a separate circuit um, on its own. Um, if you're going to start up the mill to process ore, it's probably going to take a year, year and a half to get enough ore to be built up in front of the mill before you'd start it up. Um, when we look at the full integration, uh, we will include uh, like uh, an addition to the mill to have those separate facilities. Uh, you know, to build out those separate facilities might be a few million dollars, you know, maybe three, four, five million. We don't have exact number, but we can do that fairly quickly. And we plan to put in a full proposal to the state of Utah within um, within one 
year uh, on our plans at full integration at the White Mesa Mill, including that addendum. Then let's talk separation where we're talking much bigger costs. I, I believe you said somewhere in the maybe hundreds of millions of dollars for uh, to getting it up to the point of separation. Is that still a good estimate? And when would you make a decision on that? Well, um, the board hasn't made a decision yet, but I made the decision and we'll have to debate that at the board level. But we, we uh, you know, we've been doing a fair amount of work with Carister. Uh, we're very confident that we're going to be able to do this at a lower cost than others. Um, this number, uh, probably in the order of 150 to 250 million dollars, uh, we believe is pretty pretty strong. We're still doing some checking of that, but we believe that that's what it will cost us to put full integration, uh, at least through separation um, uh, of oxides, and at the scale, sort of in the order of uh, given enough bead of Linus. Okay, let's shift over to the uh, the radioisotopes because uh, I haven't had a chance to speak to you on that one. Help help me understand. You said that's kind of a, a, a part of the monocyte. Is this technology that you have in hand at the moment to separate, or is it something that you'll be developing? Well, the, the, the Radtran approached us. Um, about the, the, the shortfall of, of the need for uh, fresh medical isotopes. And actually it wasn't just RADTRAN, we had about three, four other parties that also approached us. We hadn't really even thought about it. And um, um, RADTRAN has some patented technologies for recovering of these various isotopes. And, um, and uh, it really is that, you know, when you look at, you know, a lot of people have gotten isotopes from like the Department of Energy, and around the world, um, and and that been doing that for for decades. And similar to the uranium story, um, you know these these sources are being depleted. Some of those sources are half lifing themselves out, uh, so they're becoming sort of dirty in terms of how the uh, things are going to be used in the future. They need cleaner sources um, of these isotopes. Um, some of these new technologies that are being uh, pushed through uh, with the FDA um, are in different stages. And so, you know, we're just getting started, but it is uh, an initiative that we're gonna give serious consideration. And again, when you look at White Mesa, you look at the fact that rare earths contain high thorium, um, you know, we, we, we just think it's, you know, even those that would be processing um, may, be thinking of processing monocyte in places like Australia, uh, they'll dispose of the, th the thorium, they'll dispose of the uranium. They don't want them. We do because we think we have the ability to monetize them in due course. So watch the space, it's early. We'll certainly update the market as we make advances on that front. So I was gonna ask about a timetable and I know that's difficult it's early, but do you think we're talking a couple of years, five to 10 years, more than 10 year? No. Let's say a couple of years, okay? okay? A few years, it's not five to 10 years. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's hard for people to get their head around. Um, but, you know, when you think about it, when you go in for medical treatment and they inject you with, you know, different materials or you get a cancer treatment, uh, you know, it's a pretty uh, common issue in, um, you know, people experience, you know, in their lifetimes. And, you know, some of these advanced, uh, cancer treatments, they're, they're, you know, they're in the order of, you know, $100,000 per treatment, and the radioisotopes probably make up, you know, 10% of that, um, that cost. So, um, you know, we're just going to have to see where it goes. But the, the interesting part is that we had multiple groups approach us on this front. And um, we hope to be talking to some major pharmaceuticals in the next few months about using White Mesa as a, as a uh, source to harvest some of these materials. Well, you've got a lot going on and we could spend all day asking questions and all the components, but we're getting a little tight on time. I'm gonna leave you with one last question. Uh, what do you think that as you talk to investors that they don't understand about your company that they probably should? Well, you know, I've got a long history with producing uranium and 
I think that it's hard for people to understand energy fuels because of you know the the uranium, the vanadium, the rare earths, and now the medical isotopes. So I, I think it's hard for people to value us, but we are the real deal. We are out there looking to build substantial value for our shareholders. And uh, I don't think that we yet have recognition. Um, I think we will get that recognition. I'm very confident in what we're doing, very excited about it. And this is not a promotion. This is about creating long-term substantial values in a creative ways on the unique space that we're in and the facilities we have uh, and the fact that it's paid for um, we have a lot of proven history of doing it, and, and you know, most people that know me know that if I say something, I do it. I'm a doer, and our company are doers. So all I can say is watch the space. I'm really excited about the future. I've never seen a bigger opportunity in my entire career than I see with energy fuels right now. Well, we'll definitely keep an eye on things. Thank you for your uh, presentation and all your answers today. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for joining us for this C-Suite interview presentation brought to you by Channel Check. Visit our YouTube channel for more interview content, as well as virtual roadshows and conference presentation replays. New content is added regularly, so subscribe below to stay up to date. Visit channelcheck.com or click the link in the description to access equity research, news, and advanced market data on this and the 6,000 other small and micro cap companies listed.